Hi, welcome back to my channel. I'm so glad you're here. And I hope you uh, have been with me through the last eight uh, lessons we've had on death, if, if it's real or not. Today is um, lesson number nine, our conclusion, the rich man and Lazarus. But before we get started, as usual, I must ask, please, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, hit the post notification bell. And whatever you do, please thumbs up the video and share it if you would, please. That would help me so much. All right, let's get started. Um, this study is the conclusion of death, if it's real or not. So it's going to be a little different. The passages are long. I'm going to ask that you get your Bibles, take notes, and go back and read this for yourself. Because I'm going to refer to them and explain rather than read all of this. Because I want you to do your due diligence, okay? And so this topic of the rich man and Lazarus, so many people use this particular uh, subject uh, of the immortality of the soul because of this parable. It's found in uh, Luke 16, uh, verse 19 through 31. That's where you're going to find the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There are two views taken here. Some say it's a literal history of two men. You're going to see how foolish that is, but okay. Others say that it's a fictional story used as a parable, which is more reasonable. This account is used to prove two doctrines. The men, that man is conscious between death conscious okay between death and the resurrection which if you looked at my number eight you'll know that's not true uh and that men go to their reward or punishment as soon as they die some of you are on the game you know you've watched the videos you know what happens to man when he dies but for those who are here for the first time please go back and look at the other videos um and you'll see um, what we're talking about here. All right, so who was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom? We're going to break down this parable, which is found in Luke. So who's, who's, who's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom? In Luke 16, 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. All right, so right here, let's think about what's happening. The beggar, the poor man, goes to Abraham's bosom, wherever that is. But the rich man dies and is buried. So how did this other guy get to where he was going? Keep that in mind. This is an account of actuality then we are compelled to believe that the beggar who died was carried bodily with all of his rags and sores to the bosom of Abraham. If we're reading this literally and thinking this is real, this is what happened. Because how did he get there? He went body and everything. His sores, he just went straight to this. But the other guy was buried. All right? He was carried um, to the bosom of Abraham. The, uh, I don't think that makes any sense, but let's keep going. So what happened to the rich man? All right, so we know, we just read that the, the, the beggar guy went straight bodily to Abraham's bosom, according to the parable. So what happened to the rich man? Luke 20, 16, 22 to 24. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. 
I just want to let that marinate for a minute. That what we're reading here, that this person, one person is in the bosom of Abraham, another person's in hell, being tormented, and he can see now he's got miraculous vision that he can see into the other world and he can see uh, Lazarus and he can recognize who this guy is, okay? And he can recognize Abraham, who he's never seen before. He can recognize him and say, oh, let him come and take his finger, just his finger, and dip his finger in some water to cool my tongue. Like, come on. Burning fire is a little dip of water is going to help cool you off. Think about it now. It So, did the rich man come to life after he was dead and buried in hell? That's what you got to ask yourself. Because if he's, so in death, he became alive. After he was buried in hell. Because remember, I hope you know by now, hell is the grave. There's no such place as this tormented place of burning fire now. If you stuck with me, you know that that's not true. But just think about the story, okay? And let's see if it makes any sense to us. There are some who venture to answer that it was not the material Lazarus, but rather his soul. But remember, at the beginning of our studies, we found out that you and I are souls. This body is my soul. Okay, my body and my spirit make up who I am. Okay, my body is dead. My soul is dead. Without the spirit, it's dead. Okay, so we have no right to make such an addition to God's word. Both persons are depicted as being bodily present in the place of their reward because he has a finger and he has a tongue. So there, this story is saying the whole person is 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 there um and when i you know it's hard for me to believe after what we've learned that someone could believe this but i can believe it because people have not taken the time for themselves to study the word of god to see what happens to man when he dies in a methodical way as i think we have done and and i've only and my studies are simple very simple i mean they're not deep or anything just me, a person just studying the word of God, coming to those conclusions from what I read. But if you just want to listen to preachers, then you're not going to learn a whole lot because they're not going to teach you this kind of stuff. They just not. They, oof, child. So what is the obvious meaning then of this parable? You say, Diane, you were just going off here about this. I, and it's because I just am so, uh, I just get, over the years of my walk with Christ, I've just been so saddened by the fact that people are as ignorant of God's word as they are. And some ignorance is by choice because they choose not to pick up the scripture. And you can't read this book just on your own. You need the spirit leading you. You would need a, you need a righteous uh, spirit, <laughs> not all spirits, you know, that'll be honest and have no agenda. And most denominations have an agenda. And that agenda is for you not necessarily to come to Christ. He's just their means to get you in the door to their particular denomination. I'm just saying. So what's the obvious meaning of this parable? It has no reference to future punishment. Think about it. It has no reference to the condition of man between death and the resurrection. What Christ was talking about here is introduced in Luke 15 verse 2. So this parable goes back to, it, it follows uh, something, okay? 15 verse 2 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. All right, so they complaining. This is the leadership, Okay. This is the leadership complaining about Jesus. So this is where it started. And so he's dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes murmuring, saying this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So let's look at this. Jesus did not deny this charge. Didn't deny it. To justify his actions, Jesus introduced several 
parables. He taught in parables. So those that could hear would hear and those that would see would see. And if you chose not to either way, then it was on you. But he made it so simple that if you could hear, you would hear. And if you were able to see, you would see. So in Luke 15, verse 3 to 7, I want you to go back and read it. I don't, I'm not going to read it here, okay? I want you to pick up your Bibles, your phone, your tablet, however you get this word, and look at Luke 15, 3 to 7. This is the parable of the lost sheep. Just as the Pharisees put forth effort to bring lost sheep to the fold, and when found, they rejoiced. So that meant if a fellow Jew had been lost, gone astray, and they put forth effort to find him. You know how we do, supposedly, in the churches today. If a, well, I won't even say, because sometimes people don't put forth effort to find people that leave their so-called fold as they do a new person. If somebody's already had fellowship with you, you should have more concern for them because they were your brother or sister. And, and you should do everything you can to win them back for salvation's sake, if you love them. I don't think that happens too much today. But in this day, this is what the Pharisees would do. So Jesus said, likewise, joy shall be found in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and nine just persons which had no repentance verse 7 so that's what this parable was talking about all right the next parable he gives keep this in mind i hope you're following along in verses 8 to 10 records the parable of the lost piece of money now the pharisees would agree that the woman should search for the lost coin and when found it would cause for rejoicing Again, Jesus stated, repeated the statement, joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. So if you, the lost coin, the lady lost the coin in the house. So this is sometimes sitting right in the churches. People are lost, lost coins in the house. Sitting in church, don't have a relationship, never been born again, going through the motions, looking, as people would say, um, <laughs> paying their tithe and uh, teaching and doing all the things we do, you know, in these churches. But hearts are far from God. They're not born again, lost right in the house. So if you find, if you're really seeking and care about people, take care of the ones that are around you. You can tell these young people in church, you can tell their parents are not right, whatever the case may be. She sweeps and dusts, you know, let's say the, you know, the floors are not carpeted and like we have today, a lot of dirt, dirt floors. And, you know, so she's got to sweep to find that piece of coin, which is uh, very valuable for her. And she sweeps and then all this dust, she ends up finding the coin. She has to light a candle to even see it. And when she does, rejoices and calls her friends and everybody to rejoice. So we do over one sinner. The next parable, we're in uh, Luke 15, verses 11 to 32 now. This gives the parable of the prodigal son. I have a video on the prodigal son. Go back and uh, this, this, it's called the story of two brothers. I think it's what it's called. Go back and watch that for me. The parable of the prodigal son. Here Christ made it clear. He points his point against the Pharisees. They put forth effort to reclaim the sheep and money and were re joyful where the, when these were found. But when the lost men came to Christ to be saved, they acted like the elder brother. They were offended. So when they saw Christ uh, with, what's his name, the, the Matthew, the tax collector, or uh, Zacchaeus, the the wee little man and any sinner that came to him, people that were, these were Israelites, okay? Uh, the lame and the blind and all these sinners that they considered sinners, they were sinners themselves, but all these sinners come into Christ, they should have rejoiced, but they were that elder brother. They were, it said, uh, they were offended. 
you know, uh, who healed you? You blind man? You've been blind since birth? Who did it? Even chastised his parents and threatened to put them out of the synagogue. The people were so scared. They said, well, ask him. He he knows. He's old enough to say they were so terrified of these people. That's what's happening in these churches today. These people are so connected to these denominations that they can't think for themselves. They won't stand up for themselves. And they think that because this person has some kind of degree behind their names that they are so important and somebody simple like you and me can't read the scriptures and understand for ourselves because we're depending on them and and they want that kind of dependence okay but your salvation you're not going to be able to say in the judgment well my pastor didn't tell me that did your pastor die for you well my denomination said that your denomination died for you so like the pharisees they were upset now we move on into chapter 16, chapter 16, 1 to 13. All right. So this is where this began. It was that question, that statement from the Pharisees. This is why we get to this story. It records the parable of the unjust steward. And this is beginning. We're not at the, the rich man and Lazarus. But the Pharisees refused to be impressed by Christ's work. When we read the uh, the parable of the unjust steward, that's when he hid the money. Everybody was given so many talents and this one decided, well, this guy is kind of unjust. So I'm not going to uh, do anything with my money. I'm going to hide it and instead of multiplying, instead of working it. Okay. Continue to read on with me. So they opposed him and had no sympathy with his work. Of saving souls verse 14 of the same chapter 6 14 says and they derided him now they were just being nasty they had no respect for the work he was doing and they themselves were an unjust steward now Luke 16 we're in 15 through 18 Christ mentioned the enduring nature of his law but even though the Pharisees were sticklers for the law, oh my goodness, honey child, when I tell you they loved that law that they could not keep, they loved it. You hear me? They were rejecting Christ, the remedy for their sins. Because guess what? Law cannot save. But Christ can. The purpose of the law is to point you to your need. The purpose of the law is to magnify sin. So you recognize your condition. And when you recognize your condition, you then see your need. And the, the law points you to your need because the law can't save you. I don't care how much you keep it. I don't care what you do. You will not be saved by keeping the law. Unless you have the remedy, which is what the law points you to, which is Christ, the son of God. That's when salvation comes, all right? But the Pharisees refused to comply with the, any such arrangement. They, would, they weren't having it. They were going to stick with their law keeping, but they were going to reject the one to whom the law pointed them to. So in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the consequences resulting to the Jews for rejecting Christ are vividly illustrated. This is the illustration of the rejection of Christ by the Pharisees. So is the term hell used in this parable or the hell fire, the place of punishment for the wicked? No, it's not used. The Greek word is Hades. Remember, we learned this before, which means the grave. So if these people are in the grave, they're dead. This is a story given an illustration about the condition of the Pharisees. These people are dead. This is not happening. Okay. So when did Christ have the rich man alive? Then you, I'm sorry. Why would he have the rich man alive in the grave or Hades? Why would he even do this? Well, in answering this question, there are three reasons to consider. You should say, well, Diane, if, if these people are dead, like you say, and not conscious, why would he even do this? All right, let's see. Christ met people on their own ground. Okay, he used the story, but he met them where they were. 
Second, the doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many at that time. You know, they had come out of Babylonia. They had been in Babylonian captivity for so long. They had the truth of the uh, of the Torah had been forgotten, and they had a lot of Babylonian uh, ideas and expectations that mingled in their uh, traditions and their beliefs. Now, okay, so Jesus drew the idea from the story for this story from a common Jewish belief contrary to the Torah or the scriptures to be sure, but nonetheless, a current Jewish belief. Um, and this is, we can find this to be true in a Jewish historian by the name of Flavius Josephus in his book called Discourse to the Greeks Considering Hades. He framed his parables so as to teach important truths through their misconceived opinions. You understand that? This is what Josephus is saying. He took their misconceived opinions and weaved a story into it to try to illustrate to them the foolishness of what they believe it while in turn trying to show them themselves and teach them the truth. Jesus was a wonderful master at this. Even if you and I don't understand, he was a master at this. He was a master teacher for real, for real. Now, what are some of the lessons taught in this parable? Well, first, it is in this life that men determine their destiny, not in a life to come. Second, there is no probationary period after death. By his own choice, man fixes a gulf between him and God. By your own choices, it's a great gulf fix between you and God. And then the parable draws a contrast between the wealthy who do not make God their trust and the poor who have trusted God. That's what the parable is doing. The poor man, you in this life, you thought he was terrible beggar. You kicked him to the curb. You didn't help him. You would have, and he put, he, all he could do was put his trust in God and he would make it. The rich man on this life, y'all, all y'all think about is your money, your riches, your cars, everything. You think God is blessing you because you have this. And that is what becomes your God. And you're not trusting God. You're trusting in your riches and you're going to lose out on paradise. So, to whom did the rich man plead for help in the parable? Luke 16, 24. Well, who was he pleading for help? Who could help him? Listen. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send me Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Who can say can save you Abraham Abraham needed a savior so how is now he becoming the savior he went on to request additional help from his brethren Luke 16 27 and 28 then he said I pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send the him to my father's house for I have five brothers that they may testify unto them that he may testify unto them lest they should come to this place of torment. This request can reflect on God as though God had not thoroughly warned him. See, now he's saying, listen, I didn't do it. And I know my brothers aren't doing it. So if you send somebody or if you send him to my brothers, maybe they'll listen. Y'all all all had the same opportunity. Abraham is not God. He cannot save you. He's dead. He's in the grave. But the parable He's not even pleading to God. He's pleading to another human. And it says, call no man father. But the Jews was good about calling him father, Abraham. One is your father and that's Yahuwah. Okay. So which is important? Miracles or the written word of God? Some people think miracles are the test of all. If you got miracles, it means you showing your authority and your power with God and all of that. But listen, in this parable, listen to this. This is where at verse uh, 29 to 31 now. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. 
let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one uh, were unto sent, one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Notice God's written word is always more important than any performed miracle when he raised Lazarus from the dead, who was from Bethany, from the dead. He had been dead for four days. His Remember I talked about that in the last study? He was stinking, okay, at this point. His body was decaying. They shall reject Christ and even so, they rejected Christ. All right, so uh, let me, I'm getting stumbled here. What's more important, miracles or God's written word? You better stand on the word of God because miracles will not be the thing that will testify to make a person believe oh do you think they'll believe because they see you raise somebody from the dead well guess what jesus raised lazarus from the dead they did not believe him after seeing him raise this man from the dead after it was proven see they could have said if he had raised him on the second or third day maybe he wasn't quite dead maybe he was just really unconscious and we pronounced him dead too soon Hey, but not on the fourth day, because the fourth day he was already stinking. His sister testified to that. So they don't believe Christ after the resurrection. And guess what? They don't even believe Lazarus, the one who had been resurrected. They sought to kill him again. So miracles are not your test, brothers and sisters. You better stand on God's word and God's word alone. Because there's some, put your faith, put your faith and trust in Yahuwah, God the Father, and Yahshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay. And it says God's written word. Yeah, I read that. I said that already, right? So they read it. What was the gulf between the rich man and Abraham? The gulf between the rich man and Abraham, the gulf between them was disobedience. Abraham had believed and served God in faith and obedience. That's what Abraham had done. Even though the Jews were descendants of Abraham, yet they were rejecting the Messiah whom Abraham accepted. John uh, eight fifty six says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. And, and read through, that's 56, but read through 59 to get the whole whole picture, okay? What did I say? John 8, uh, 56 through 59. Read that whole thing. So Jesus came to break down the wall of petition between the Israelites. I almost say the Israelites, the Hebrew Israelites and the Gentiles, the Israelites and the pagans, the Israelites and the heathens. He came to give all equal opportunity for salvation. This parable has no reference to future punishment or a condition of man between death and the resurrection. There is no support for the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. We are mortals. We are subject to death and we all die. After that, the judgment. Okay. The only way to obtain life in another world after death is by the resurrection. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15 and 16, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so, be that the dead rise not. If he didn't do it, then the dead, if Jesus didn't raise, if God, if Yahuwah didn't raise up Jesus, and nobody else is going to be raised. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. So let us now prepare to be ready for his appearance. You would ever said, if we don't believe in the resurrection, if you believe there's life after death, soon as people die, after all that we've read, I don't know what to tell you. You're, if you're going to be like a Pharisee, I'm sorry. 
But today, I would pray that you go back to over all nine lessons and and see. And there's more you can explore. That this is, I'm telling you, there's nothing going to teach you about life after death except through the resurrection. Christ's death proves to us how we get to heaven. You die, you sleep, you're raised. Some to righteous everlasting life and some will be to damnation. Okay? I just pray that you won't be the one in the second resurrection. That you will be in the first. All right? Believe God. Believe his word. Accept his son as your savior. And walk in in the light you know it's not just believe and go on and live the unholy unrighteous life you gotta believe and receive the life of christ and you be born again and walk in the light as he is in the light all right i hope you enjoyed this is not for your entertainment but i hope you enjoyed the series i pray that you go back over all of the other lessons and see for yourself if death is real if it's real or not all right, so until we meet again in the next video, may the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Shalom.